Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, and I'm here with Ken Hamilton, my partner. Hello. We are here to start season two. Season two. Yep. So we, season one's all wrapped up. <laughs> we wrapped up season one, which was a very fast paced. We were we were doing at least two a week. We were trying to cram together that season one because we, get the holidays, we were talking about holiday holidays specific stress and relationships. And we were applying it through the lens, the project relationship lens, the idea that you can work on specific areas of your relationship in a sort of systematic way that allows you to create the relationship intentionally that you actually mean to be having. Season one was really fun. We learned a lot of stuff about we did. ourselves yeah. doing it. Um, and we learned that some people really do feel seen by being able to see other people. There's, yeah. I, I got a lot of comments about how, hey, people don't talk about their relationship. Usually there's a- It's all in the abstract. There are abstract ideas, exactly. And Ken and I have made this commitment to being transparent. Yeah. It's a little us. scary. <laughs> and, and whatever that, however that is useful to listeners, great. Yeah. So season two is starting off with a different format. We're going to, we'll record once a week, I think, instead of twice a week. I so think you'll so. probably we, we see were, once we a were, week. We were rushing downloads. to get in yep. everything around the holidays in this. But we're going to talk about a variety of topics that, um, some of them have been requested. Some of them have been um, suggested as, wow, nobody's talked about that from the angle you're coming at it from. And we're going to jump right into the deep end of the relationship yeah, pool. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, we're going to do a little series here at the beginning talking about um, consensual non-monogamy. Now, I studied this professionally um, as well as living it. And I studied it in part because I think it's fascinating and because the concept of consensual non-monogamy or ethical non-monogamy or polyamory, whichever word you want to choose, and they're not completely interchangeable, but for the purposes of our conversation, they are interchangeable in our household. Yeah. And they, they all capture the, they capture the, the essence of what we're going for. But it's important to know that when we're talking about topics like this, we are coming at them from our angle. We're, we can't prescribe for other people. Oh, no. We don't have an agenda. I don't think that um, there is a right relationship style for any set of people or any individual to be in. Um, the <laughs> no, the writer I'm... James Hillman said, it's not so much a, well, I'm paraphrasing here. It's it's not a question of which, which, um, way we learn to solve the problem, which model we use, it's which model serves us best in in the right. mess of our own psyche. You're we're all gonna come we all have our problems and our stuff and our history. And then there are these different relationship models we could potentially apply. And whichever one works for you best in the life that you have right now. Great. It's great. And there isn't a hierarchy for me either of relationships. It's not as though there's like, you should <laughs> like, you have to get good at monogamy before you do polyamory. Some people are polyamorous their whole life. Some people come to it later. It, so any hierarchy you're imagining or anything that you imagine is 100% true about people who do monogamy or people who do ethical non-monogamy or whatever, I would invite all of us, myself included, to just set down our expectations yeah. of there being one way to look at any of this. Um, their relationships, which means they're dynamic, they're complicated, they're messy, and that's good news. It really is. The good news is that in that mess, you can find a way for your soul to be more itself, for you, for the unique spark that you are yeah. to light up. And, and it's... And the the goal of your 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 goal for your relationships will help you figure out what 
kind of a relationship you want to have. And the more explicit you can be about that for yourself, the easier it is to figure out what you want to do. Right. And then you can communicate differently. So let's do a little um, a little vocabulary just to Definitely. establish what exactly we're talking about. Yeah. So if we defined monogamy as an agreement between um, any two people um, to have a set of behaviors and responsibilities and and commitments to each other that are unique to that one dyad, that, that, those two people, unique to that. Um, there are lots of ways to define monogamy, but I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm talking about people who've decided right. to commit to each other in a in a dyad, in a two person system. Dyad. That's that's the key. It's a two person system. And then when you get as soon as you move past that into the the realm of other relationships, there are lots of ways for things to look. Um, consensual non-monogamy can actually be a, an extremely monogamous looking relationship. It can be an extremely um, all different looking relationship. It's not going to look like there is no one template. But the one thing that holds true against uh, uh, among all of the consensual non-monogamy is ethical non-monogamy is polyamory is that there's honesty. The the difference between this and non-monogamy that is cheating is that all the parties involved know what they're agreeing to. And it, it was a consensual agreement. It wasn't coerced. It wasn't, um, it wasn't done behind someone's back. You don't back into it and say, I was cheating, but now we're in an open relationship. So it doesn't count. It, it, we there's were a, on a break. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. A very <laughs> friends moment. Okay. Yeah. So the, the key is the, the honesty. Now, that doesn't mean that mistakes can't be made and trust can't be violated in yeah. non-monogamy, consensual non-monogamy. Trust can be violated. Because, yeah, it's and it's happened like in our relationship where we have made mistakes yes. and and we realize that it's about whatever agreement you've made. So the, we're going to do a little series here talking about ethical non-monogamies. And so today we're talking about what it is and why we live this way. And then next we'll talk about, I think we'll head into um, talking about th what the agreements actually look like and what the possibilities are and what happens when when it doesn't work out yeah. or when your expectations aren't met. Because any, any set of human relationships involves bumps and bruises and getting each yeah. other way, hurting each other. It, it happens. We're, we're complicated critters. Right. And so there's always going to be that. So we're just going to talk it out and we'll see where this goes. And I think it's going to be like three episodes, this little, this little bit, but we'll see. Maybe we'll it'll see. be longer um, or maybe we'll come back and revisit it again after. And if people have responses and comments that we yeah, want Yeah, if you want in. to reach out to us with a question that you'd like us to specifically address, please do. Um, I'll do my best to do that on a future episode. You can reach me at jolie at joliehamilton.com. So... In the special vocabulary category, I think it's important to say, well, there's the obvious polyamory. Um, lots of people know what it means, but not everybody does. Poly and amory, Latin and Greek mixed together, meaning many loves. Um, it's English. That's what happens. Yeah. We, we have colonized everything, including language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is one word. There is a there are a host of other words that you can use for these things. There are and, and non monogamy. So we don't advocate any relationship style. As yeah. we said, this is not a marketing pitch this is a for non monogamy. Your own this is just insight into how we approach it. That's it. That's all this is. And the phrase non monogamy, um, it it bugs me a little because of how it it um, centers monogamy as though it's the default. But right now we don't actually have that many categories of relationships. So it's pretty much either monogamy or not. It's, <laughs> and we, we're starting to develop some nuance in how we words. talked about the other relationships. But for, for this purposes, we're talking about non-monogamies, polyamory, non-monogamy, same and, thing right now. That's how we're using it. And uh, I mean, my spell check still, I had to add polyamory to my spell check dictionary. Mm -hmm. I had to add non-monogamies. The idea of non-monogamies versus non-monogamy, like I had to add that. The idea that there are a multiplicity of ways to have relationships um, is really at the center of it. And so when we're talking about it, there are words that may come up along the way that 
are new. Um, one of the words that often strikes people, they hear the word compersion. Now I have a whole TEDx on the word compersion. Um, so you can certainly find it. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, and the word compersion is, well, it means the opposite of jealousy, essentially. It's the feeling of joy for your partner's joy, for another person's joy. Not just when you witness it, not just when it includes you, not just like, oh, you're both enjoying dessert, but even if it excludes you. And so that's one word that came out of the, it came out of the idea of non-monogamies and how you, you shift your, your way of thinking some when you're not in the monogamous mindset. But there are other words. Um, and so if you also, if you, if you see, hear us talking about a word that is new, I mean, everything's Googleable these days, but seriously reach out because I'm, I'm always interested to have these conversations. And also, since this is sound, not text, sometimes new words, you don't even know how to look it up because there's can't a good one. Yeah, it. like compersion, C O M P E R S I O N. Compersion. And that one, I mean, it almost got misspelled in my TEDx That's talk. Right. It was misspelled twice yeah. in the online and in the program itself because it just kept getting corrected and people couldn't see past it. They kept seeing compassion comparison, or seeing comparison. Which completely changed the right. title. It changes the, the whole meaning. So what I learned when I was doing my dissertation research, I learned how to look at the idea of monogamy and, and see like what it was made of. And there's a great book out there if you're interested in the history of monogamy. Um, it's called Marriage, A Short History. Um, goodness gracious, I'm gonna, I lost her name, Stephanie Kuntz. There, oh, right. C O O T N Z, great book, um, and it's available audio if you're interested in the history of monogamy. It's not as long a history as you might think, um, at least in the way we imagine it now. This, the idea of the love-based marriage, is you know 150 years old. Before that, marriages were generally built on a foundation of survival or um, a lot <laughs> of political, socio-political yeah. empires. Well, my grandmother was sent off to marry someone. Yeah. It wasn't a it choice wasn't a of choice. hers. She already had a relationship she liked. She was sent out of the country to go marry somebody in another country. Right. So, and that was my grandmother. Yeah, that's not, not that, that long, long ago. ago. You're not that old. Not that old. It was I less... mean, you're old, but you're not that old. Okay, it was a little less than 100 years ago. <laughs> okay, you're a little older. Okay, a little older. <laughs> Anyways, um, what I also looked at was, and this was something that I looked at throughout my study, and I actually talked to my study participants about what it means to be practicing non-monogamy is it i wanted to know from people did they did they choose it was it something that they decided one day oh, i'm going to i'm going to do this i'm going to have multiple loving relationships all at once or did they have a philosophical alignment with it you know had they read a book and decided i think this is the right way i, I i'm going to choose this path for myself or did they feel that it was an essential part of themselves? Did they recognize it as part of their identity, something innate and endemic to themselves? So there are these three different ways, a philosophy, um, an identity, or a situational behavior choice. And what I found was about two thirds of my study participants fe felt that their polyamory or their ethical non-monogamy was at least partially an identity piece. It was, it was baked into them. They felt that they were hardwired this way. Another third felt that they were making a choice. They could be happy monogamously, and they had just made a choice to follow this path. Um, and so now I get to my first awkward question, because we talked about this a lot in our early yes, relationship, we but we don't talk about it day to day now. How do you feel about yourself now? Is this what? Well, it's funny, it because as you were talking, I was thinking... I didn't want to interrupt you right then that there's, I mean, a lot of times I do want to interrupt you, but not right then. Um, there's a fourth category and it's people who, for whom the concept of non-monogamy hasn't come to them yet. Right. They're in they don't pre, even, they're pre-imagination. Pre they, yeah. You, it's not yet pre-imaginal. And um, I think that when It's hard I, to be something that you don't know. It's the hard name to be of. something you don't know the name of. It's challenging. And, um, I remember the first time I, um, had an awkward discussion with someone 
I was already in a relation with some relationship with someone, and I had an awkward conversation with somebody else saying, so if I wasn't in a relationship, I think you'd be perfect. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, but you are. I'm like, okay, I guess that's the end of that conversation. Okay. And I think that's the first time it occurred to me to, to think out past or feel out past the monogamous viewpoint. And it was... You have a truth detection machine because your eyes are I know, watering right? a little My bit eyes right are now. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I can see you feeling that memory. Yeah. And it was. Um, Were you in college then? No. Okay. No, it's... not yet. I was I'd probably seen like right summer before my senior year. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe right after. Anyway, right so in that So early. Area. So you have this, 17. this idea, this like burgeoning sort of. Mm -hmm. notion but without a name for it it is hard it is and what it felt to me was greedy and uh um and well unethical yeah like i was asking for something that was against the bounds of society because i was because it is you know it was at the time that no you, but, the society as you know it society. had knew, or knew it had no space for that to be anything other than unethical yep. and greedy yeah so you and couldn't imagine into it. I think that the imagination piece is so important. So I would say that it came up out of me because it 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 came out without any support, you know, without their the imagination of it having been yeah. presented to me in any way that I can remember. Now there's a lot more. And you did a whole uh, conference talk on the presence of non-monogamies. Right. Uh, there is there is more representation available at this point we see at least hints um and yeah i have a, a whole presentation on that on how the <laughs> on how ethical non-monogamies are unfortunately so it's great that there's representation unfortunately it is often the case that consensual non-monogamy is painted for the monogamous gaze for the right. heteronormative yeah. monogamous gaze for yeah. the white supremacist heteronormative <laughs> monogamous gaze that's the the picture that's painted um you know i mean i think the the iconic image that would you know <laughs> that would represent that is all of the all of the white feet poking out of the end of a oh bed sheet right yeah. like that that picture you're like yeah. okay i think you've is, missed the oh, okay. it's not okay yeah so consensual non-monogamies are about so much more than a bunch of people having sex for sure and in fact that's Generally speaking, the the least kind of it of the all. Least of it, um, um, or at least in our experience and the experience of talking to so many people about this. Well, I, it it's a fun. It takes part. up the least amount of my emotional and mental resources to manage. Yeah, like the the sex. Okay, yes, it can get complicated, and emotional stickiness can come out of it, but. So much more comes out of the whole rest of life than just yeah. having sex. Yeah. But you asked me, you know, where where I thought I came in that. I think it it comes out of me. I think it it's part of my so you identity. Feel like it's your identity. Yeah. How about you? I so I had identified that capacity in myself very very early, but so yeah, some fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. But it was so outside of my imagination that I thought it was a kink. So. I, I thought of that specifically as, yeah, that was me. It's definitely part of my identity, but I thought of it as a kink and a shameful one at that, something yeah. I needed to control, um, something I needed to keep under wraps, not to admit to, or when I, and because of my own defense mechanisms, admit, I would actually admit things like this. I would say it, I wear my heart on my sleeve so that nobody else could hurt me with it. I feel strongly that it's an identity, but that's actually not the important part to me. Like, I, I feel like there it is. I don't know that I could strip this piece of me away, even if I needed to. In fact, it's been requested of me in the past and I was not able to. Um, the request came in the form of, please don't feel that way. And I didn't know how not to feel a certain way. I could, I could control my thoughts and I could control my actions. I didn't know how to control my feelings. Maybe that's because I'm an ENTJ. <laughs> I don't know how to control. My feeling function is my ch most childish function. Well, I don't know. I'm I'm all the opposite of that. And you've seen how well I do at not feeling my feelings. <laughs> I mean, I pretend not to. And that just causes more problems. It doesn't help. <laughs> but, you know, I, I also don't feel like it's just a situational choice for me. I feel like the philosophy... 
once I started really researching and I and reading and reading and reading, and I have dozens of books downstairs about um, not just ethical non-monogamies, but monogamy and all of its different forms and facets and relationships in many, many ways, and lots of people talking about different relationships. Once I started um, combing through all of that literature, I realized that I am, I consider myself ethically non-monogamous or polyamorous because it's the philosophical path that most aligns with my beliefs. Right. I feel committed to it so that when it's hard, I feel a, a commitment to living this. Yeah. Like my, it's my, it's bigger than just ethical non-monogamy. It feels like my ethics of non-monogamy. I feel, I feel. It's beholden. in line with your values and ethics. And I would, I feel out of line and, and it actually mm -hmm. hurts. I feel this twisting sensation in my chest when I think about being in charge of or being connected in any, like being, uh, being in charge of who you feel things about or being the reason that you might jam some part of yourself down like that these are things that don't work for you yeah it makes yeah. me physically uncomfortable and the more time i've spent allowing myself to not do that with you the the more myself i feel it's i mean it's taken years and years it's not that i don't get jealous i absolutely do we can do a whole episode oh, on yeah, jealousy i have lots to say about that. jealousy so we'll do a whole episode on jealousy but it's not that i just the concept, the idea of being the the person who decides or being the the only reason you make a decision is an agreement we had years ago without getting to revisit it. Just it just doesn't sit in my soul well. Yeah. And it's not for me. I really do believe monogamy works well for lots of people, but for me, that gets in the way and I wind up feeling um like I'm controlling you. And also, like you would be controlling me, yeah. If you asked me to have that agreement yeah, I, with you, I agree. So the philosophy. I agree with your philosophical standpoint there, because when I say I'm non-monogamous, polyamorous, I think I more often use polyamorous <laughs> myself. When I say that, I don't mean that I'm running around looking for dates. Or looking for new relationships. Oh, God knows it. You, it's you. You're very shy. For so there's that. <laughs> but what I'm specifically saying is, I don't feel pulled to find multiple people to have relationships with. It's like it doesn't come. up. That's not the part of me it comes out of. The part of me it comes out of is the part that, like you were saying, well, I, I love you. I wouldn't want to be in the way of your love. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop you reading books. You love books. I wouldn't get in the way of that. So I, um, you don't stop me from playing badminton with other people. I do not stop you from playing badminton with other people, <laughs> even when I'm not there to play badminton. But when badminton becomes sex, all of a sudden, all of a sudden the, the perspective, the perspective changes. changes. And, and I don't think, I don't say that <clears throat> lately. It's not funny. No, we, it, it's, we bond to each other as 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 love objects we bond we transfer it in you are absolutely my attachment figure that's i have transferred my attachment to you and so it's not like i take this lightly it's not easy to say here you're com you you are completely your own and that love yourself first and stay like stay true to yourself first, whatever that means. It's not like it's totally easy to do that. No, it isn't. It's part it's, of me wants to wrap you up in my arms yeah, and never share a, you. And it's a little scary to say, so I have in, I mean, one of the things that, um, that I say to you is you have my heart. Yeah. And it's a little scary to hand your heart to someone and then tell them, okay, you know, do whatever you want. <laughs> That's a little scary. <laughs> it and scary. it requires, trust but also constant communication yeah there's um and and agreements like okay here's my heart okay yeah so here's my heart do whatever you want but like every other human interaction 
there's all this stuff that hasn't been said. Do whatever you want as long as <laughs> right, the, the, the things that we agreements. have already either implicitly or explicitly yeah. agreed to. There's all that stuff hovering around that. And, and it, can, we'll, it gets pretty let's complicated Let's do a pretty whole fast. episode yeah. on agreements because yeah. there is no set of rules you can define that will protect you from getting your feelings hurt in any relationship. No, we've all seen what happens when when a genie comes out of a bottle and you make a wish. Oh yeah, that does not go You well. cannot write that wish well enough. No, that was an assignment. To... My fourth grade teacher gave us that assignment. We had to write, we had to write up our one wish and then she poked holes in all the ways. What oh. a great logic lesson. It was a great logic lesson. It was ouchy. An that ouchy. was a large yeah. yikes. It yeah. was. <laughs> It was not comfortable. I was, you know, in fourth grade and I'm like, oh, I'll never be able to get what I want <laughs> because somehow I thought the magic genie was going to be like the path <laughs> forward. I'm not sure what that was all about. What but... is that? Like 10th grade? We get a genie? Awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm going to prep. No, it's true though. There isn't a set of rules. And so I have handed you um, keys to, to my heart in many ways. Like you understand how I work, um, which also means, you know, ways to hurt me. Right. So yeah, along a... with here, I trust you, go ahead is also more than that. It's I trust you. And you have a set of instructions that if you chose to use it to hurt me, I mean, you, like yep. it is a complete set of instructions. Absolutely. There. <laughs> like, you um, you've been introduced to the the inner workings enough to do so. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I and I wanted to. I want to say that you never do that, but I don't think that's reasonable. No, I, I think, think reasonably that's, speaking, that would be we poke each other. Absolutely, not just by accident, but also on purpose. Sometimes mm -hmm. it it happens, and it's what we do with that. And trying to figure out how to trust each other, knowing that none of it's simple, and that we can't just rely on an idea of, you know. <sighs> Till death to us part was never going to be enough for the two of us. No, no, that's um, I, it, that's not how I think. It about... just didn't. It didn't work, and so we have these really complicated questions. Another piece of our relationship and part of our why, every three years we renegotiate our relationship. Yep. And so consensual non-monogamy is on the table then. Like, are, are is this the is path this, we're we still, still walking? Still doing that. Um. So every three years since we got married. We have a big, um, well, basically a month of time when it's yep. reasonable, the whole month of September. Okay, we're talking it all out again. We're starting as if we were signing right. our marriage license fresh. Yeah, it's it's not a it's not that we never oh, renegotiate, we talk, talk about agreements, Absolutely. whatever, but this is like, okay, we know that it's 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 the off ramp. It's is the it, off ramp. Like it's a it's, it's a, a time built when we in um um consistent frequency off ramp so it's and i feel it coming when when we're yeah, getting close oh yeah. to a three year mark i have felt yeah. it like okay we're gonna have some really intense conversations yeah. and our our monogamy agreements are part of those conversations now we have renegotiated specifically into and out of monogamy yep, i was going to talk um, about that next during too. during the middle of a three-year cycle so it's not like it happens in three-year cycles and that's it no but that that's another way in which I feel like we have a philosophy for, for how we relate, but I also have a philosophy for how I relate. I decided that if I was ever going to get married again, it had to have a built-in re-upping yep. schedule. And I, I just couldn't commit to being married otherwise, because being married means that the state has something to say about your relationship, not yep. just you. Okay. And so I wanted to have at least an emotional agreement that, yep, and a written one that we renegotiate, that yeah. we talk this stuff out and that we have to go to mediation if we can't talk it out. So we wrote that up for each other. And it, I mean, that's the only form of prenup we have, but yeah. it's, it's an important one for me. It's very important. And it also lets me stay in this space of feeling in alignment with the choice to be ethically non-monogamous. I, I feel that. Um, yeah, it's, it's easier to stay in that spot. Well, we so should probably a lot. wrap up. I was soon. just going to yeah, say, I'm not so entirely sure how to wrap this up. There's okay. so much. To we will it. come back to this subject. We're actually, I think we're going to, I think we're going to record a few episodes right in a row. Yeah. So you won't be able to ask us questions before the first three episodes are out, but please do 
Um, we'll, we're going to record some episodes back to back here, but you'll be able to ask us questions and we can come back around to them. We can do a Q and a, yeah. maybe we'll even hop in clubhouse and do oh, a little, um, a little AMA time fun. in clubhouse. Yeah. So if anybody's interested and has more questions, yeah, just reach out to us at yep. Jolie Hamilton, Please. Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. And yeah, I will see you for the next episode. Yes. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>